direction northeast. Hello, I'm Chelsea Teaster. This program is a presentation of the Communications Department of Northeast State Community College. This episode of Direction Northeast has a classical theme as we look at modern pop culture only to find the influences of the Odyssey. We'll meet our guest and start our discussion following these messages. My name is Amanda Broom. I'm a mass communications graduate. I work behind and in front of the camera, and I got my start at Northeast State. We are constantly connected to our smartphones and to the internet, and that's why mass communications in particular is incredibly important because we need it. I belong in college because I love learning. I love meeting people, and I love discovering new things. The best part about coming here was a quality, personal education that was also affordable. From the Odyssey as basis for the film, O Brother, Where Art Thou, to countless references from The Simpsons to Xena, the warrior princess, ancient literature seems alive and well. Our guest today will provide an entertaining look at how classic literature and mythology is firmly embedded into today's pop culture. Stephanie Murray, welcome yeah. to Direction Northeast. Thank you for having me. You are very welcome. We're so glad to have you. Yeah. Um, so. What exactly, what exactly has motivated you so much? Um, I know that you are actually a Liz McRae graduate. Mm -hmm. um, you received your Bachelor of Arts in Literature and Mythology. Um, so I'm just so curious, what makes you want to be so successful? Yeah, um, well, I think that my interest in mythology, um, it, it's been a lifelong interest for me. So while I ended up studying literature and I did, you know, do an emphasis with some mythology, I did literature and religious studies and some philosophy and kind of tied it all back in together. Um, for me, I was just lucky to be raised in a family that really believed in literature and really believed in reading and especially the classics. Um, my mom is a big reader. She is an English major and uh, my sister is a writer and has her master's in children's literature. My grandfather was a mythologist and gave me a ton of books. So um, I was just, I was that kid that was always that really into this kind of stuff. I used to read books on Greek gods and trace pictures of them and um, do, you know, it was just always something that was a part of my life. So it seemed like a natural fit when I started studying it in a little bit more depth. Mm -hmm. So you could say that it runs in the family a little it bit. It definitely runs in the family. Yeah. It's something that we, we all value a lot. Yeah, definitely. Nice. Yeah. Um, how do you think uh, that it's important in modern times to read mythology? Well, I think that, you know, that was a big part of what my talk was about. Um, I think that it's sort of unfortunate that sometimes people look at the classics as being something that's walled off by academics and that they don't see it as something that's approachable to them. And if people would understand how frequently the classic um, classics like the Odyssey or the Iliad or the Epic of Gilgamesh and all these like really you know the stuff that you're forced to read in your literature classes um, if people would get an interest in them just on the basis of how wildly entertaining they are in their own way um, that that would really help them it also I think would help people to understand and to catch the cultural references around them and that's a big part of what I talked about today was um, that there's cultural references everywhere and from you know the Simpsons, Xena, Warrior Princess, not really the coolest reference there, but you know there's uh, references all around us to these things. And if you're not taking the time to educate yourself on some of the classics, you're missing out on a lot of the jokes, and you're in, and you may not be able to appreciate some more modern literature in the way that you should because you're not really understanding the underlying story that builds the foundation for that. So. There, you know, I use a lot of tie-ins and things like that in what I was talking about because um, I think that there's a lot of depth to TV and movies and literature all around us and people are, are missing those cultural references because they, they, they think, oh, the Odyssey, that's something that, you know, I have to read or I'll do the bare minimum for my paper. Um, and they don't really take the time to delve into that story in the way that they should because it's really good. It's a really good story, guys. Odyssey. Would you consider it one of your favorites? Um, yeah, uh, it's one of, it's, you know, it's important. So <laughs> um, I think that, you know, uh, there's, 
the thing with Greek myths and with the Odyssey is that they all tie back in together. So, like, I love Greek mythology. And when you're looking at something like Homer or the, the Odyssey, you have to understand that these are stories that evolved over time and were told in a lot of different ways. So while just reading the Odyssey itself may not be one of my favorite things, um, you know, the story of Athena, who is a character in the Odyssey, if you are reading the Odyssey, that will lead you to learn more about Athena. Athena is one of my favorite characters in mythology. She's this like really tough, bad A woman <laughs> who is just fully, she springs fully formed from her father's head. I mean, that's like a really cool, interesting story there. And she sort of um, symbolizes everything about like the strong feminist principles that I really believe in. Um, so yes, yeah, so well, th to answer your question, that while the Odyssey is maybe not my favorite thing to just sit down and dive into and read cover to cover, um, its tie-ins to Gre ancient Greece and, and all of those myths are incredibly important to me. So you said that uh, Athena, she kind of had like a masculine role. Mm -hmm. um, would you technically consider that a feminist uh, part of the, the story because y usually women are thought to be kind of not in control mm -hmm. and meek and very yeah. submissive. Would you, would you consider that? That's a good question. Um, I think that, you know, in a, w a way to rephrase that question would be to even say, you know, what, what is a real feminine principle? Are women meant to just be around the hearth or the home? Or are women meant to be domineering warriors in the same way that you know, men are. And I think that when we look at things like Greek mythology and ancient literature, we'll find that the way that we represent women in certain cultures, you know, it's, it's not a new thing for women to be like tough or to women to be active roles in, in making change or being warriors and all these things. These are old stories. These are thousands of years old stories. So, you know, there's, I think that they, you can find a role model for whatever kind of woman you want to be in Greek mythology. You can be an Aphrodite, you can be a pretty makeup Aphrodite girl, or you can be, <laughs> you know, uh, running through the woods with your bow and arrow and your team of huntress kind of girl. So they're, they're all there in Greek mythology, ladies. Nice. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the heroes or anti-heroes that you feel have been stemmed from mythology? Um, well, that's a good question. There's a lot for one thing, there's um, heroes and anti-heroes, you know, in every story. I mean, that's what makes a story, is you have to have, you know, the protagonist, you have to have the antagonist, and you have to have the push and pull between the two. Um, there is a lot of, you know, modern day um, heroes that I would say are based on old heroes. Uh, well, I mean, for example, I think Thor is out in the theaters right now, the movie Thor. Uh, my husband apparently just went and saw it in 3D. Obviously, that ties back <laughs> in. Um, you know, they weren't doing 3D, but, and maybe he caught the cultural references. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But, they, uh, but there's um, some of the movies that I talk about in my talk are Cold Mountain, um, which is written by Charles Frazier and takes place just an hour outside of here in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, that hero and heroine are very much based on the story of the Odyssey and Odysseus. So yeah, there's a ton. You'll find, you'll find a lot of, of um, heroes are based on that first story, if you keep looking. Nice. Yeah. Um, so I've read that your favorite uh, author is Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. What is it exactly about his works that, that just draws you in, makes you so interested? Well, Joseph Campbell is a really important figure um, in mythology. And Joseph Campbell was the guy that came up with the monomyth. And if you're not familiar with the monomyth, what that is, is it's the story, the understanding that each story um, can be retold by using the same basic principles of structure in mythology, OK? And what Joseph Campbell believed, and a lot of his principles are based off of um, of young, you know, in psychology, and this idea of this collective unconscious that we all carry the same stories within us, and that's why certain things resonate with us. So, if you're watching a movie and you feel the way that the character feels, Joseph Campbell would say that's because that's telling your own story. We all are living a narrative in our own way, and 
um, Joseph Campbell was the first person to kind of point this out and take all of these different myths and say, look at how this story is retold here in India, and you can find the same thing. You'll find flood stories. You'll find stories of virgin birth. You'll find like all these same themes all around the world. Now, there's two, you know, theories there. Like, okay, did everyone just tell each other the same story? Or is that just something that's part of our psychology that we write out in literature? And he would say that we do. I find that really fascinating. And I also find it to be um, reassuring in a lot of ways. So I always tell people a lot of my best friends are books, which sounds lonely. <laughs> um, and maybe it is. But it's also, uh, to me, when I'm reading a book, I'm, I'm learning something about myself. And I think that you can have a real conversation with a book if you're reading it in the right way. So. so what exactly is your favorite myth? You were speaking about how you know there are myths all over all over the world that are so common yeah. yet so far away. What would be your favorite myth? Ooh, okay, that's a tough question um, because and my answer might be controversial. Uh, some people wouldn't like to think of the Bible as a myth, but I think that a lot of the old myths in the Bible. Um, when you say the word myth, myth doesn't mean untrue necessarily. So, you know, your belief system is your own belief system. But there's, uh, there's, to me, some of the, I mean, even just the story of Genesis uh, is one of my favorite things to read. I think it's really beautiful. When you study it in, in Hebrew, um, it's an incredibly beautiful tale. And what's so cool about it is how the authors kind of deliberately made it mythology and a lot of people don't realize that but when you're reading the, the story of Genesis you have you know this first story that's told this one way and then the second creation story it doesn't line up well that's a deliberate thing by the authors that were writing down these stories because they wanted people to have a conversation with this and not to take things literally that was the point <laughs> it was to not take it literally so I think that some of my favorite myths really do come from the Bible um, in that you know, those are they're incredible lessons when they're read the right way. And there's a lot of beauty in the language there. And I think that um, Hebrew myths particularly can be very beautiful in the way that they're, they're put together and in the poetry of that. So, yeah. Um, you said that it was really beautiful uh, to read in Hebrew. Can you read Hebrew? Uh, I can a little bit of Hebrew. And there's, but what I can do is I, I know enough about, you know, that language to, to understand, um, the structure. So there's a, a way that those stories are meant to be read. Um, it's kind of hard, to, but to explain really simply, but they there's a you know like Shakespeare. You're reading Shakespeare. There's a certain meter and rhyme to that and rhythm, right? So it's the same thing with with um, books in the Bible. So in Old Hebrew, they, they there's an expectation that certain words are going to mean more. Um, there's also I was talking about this a little bit earlier in my talk um, with ancient Greek and with Hebrew, the words can have varied meaning. So there's a lot more fluidity there than what we, you know, when I say air, you know what air means. But in Greek, you know, that's pneumos. And that can mean anything from air to breath to spirit, all these different things. So you have this like elasticity in the language, which I think is really interesting. So. That is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, what lessons do you think that mythology can teach you? I think that mythology is, is our way of um, expressing lessons that already exist. So if we have a, you know, we know what good and bad is and what our immorality is, I think, and I think deep down we do. I believe that we're born with that. But um, a, myth, a myth can tell that story in a way that can, I guess, take something that you feel and make it something that you can see. So, you know, the story of Prometheus and, or, you know, going and taking the fire and, you know, that's, that's something that we, that's a lesson in, you know, knowledge and it's a kind of in the same way, it's the same story of the Garden of Eden and eating the apple. Um, you know, how much do you want to learn? Where is that going to take you? What is the, the price of, you know, cashing in your blissful ignorance for knowledge, you know, you might open up a whole 
Hand worms, Pandora's box. Again, that's a term that we use, the Pandora's box. That's a, you know, that comes from mythology as well, opening that box and you, who knows what's gonna come out of it. So sometimes it teaches you a lesson on, you know, what to delve into, how to treat people, um, vanity, hubris, um, all those sorts of things, so, yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to switch gears here a little bit. Okay. And we're going to focus on uh, the Odyssey. Okay. What exactly, uh, what exactly does pull you towards the Odyssey? Um, the Odyssey is a great story in that it's, uh, it's a story of a man going home to his wife. And the whole thing is he just is struggling to get back home. And he's encountering all these problems. Some of those problems come from his own vanity and his own arrogance. Some of them come from the team of guys that he's with when they open up the bag of winds and it sends the ship off course. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a sweet tale. He's in love and he just wants to go home to his wife. And I think that that's wonderful. And she's at home waiting for him and, you know, like she's total babe too. So she's got to like keep all the suitors away and they're all trying to to you know, take his place because she's the queen, and you know, there's a lot to be gained there. Um, but it's really it's a love story. So you know, it's an old it's an old love story, and I'm drawn to that. So, so would you consider yourself a sucker for love stories? Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely a sucker for a good love story. I can be a hopeless romantic sometimes. Yeah. So <laughs> nothing wrong with that. No, no. It's good. So there are. Um, there are many things that are influenced by the Odyssey, uh, such as Brother, Where Art Thou? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel like they, they kind of go with each other? Well, there's a lot of, there's a ton of study um, in that. Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? is one of the best examples of a retelling of the Odyssey. Um, it's very clearly deliberate, and even though the directors claim that they didn't intend it, they totally did. Um, the John Goodman character is wears an eye patch, he's the Cyclops. And there's um, the scene that I showed in my presentation earlier where one of um, George Clooney's, you know, compadres on this epic journey, they, he runs down into the river and gets baptized. That's the Lotus Eaters. There's, a, you know, for every episodal part of the Odyssey, you can find a tie into a Brother Where Art Thou? Also, it's got some really, really great music in it. So that's a, <laughs> you know, that's a real upside of that story, of that movie. Um, really beautiful music in, in there. Yeah. What are some of the, the other shows or, or music or anything really that, that is also referred to uh, by the Odyssey? Um, well, there is a Cream song, and uh, Eric Clapton's band, and the which, oh my gosh, now I'm gonna blank on it. The something of Ulysses, oh my gosh, the something tale of Ulysses. It's cream, you, if you're interested, you can find it. So it's, uh, <laughs> but that's a great song. Um, there's also a, gosh, okay, Cold Mountain. Um, that's one of the things I talk about. Uh, the book Cold Mountain by Charles Frazier and the, the movie, um, that's a very deliberate retelling of the Odyssey. Um, one of the more famous ones would be 2001 Space Odyssey. So the uh, Stanley Kubrick film, which has a lot of references back to it. Simpsons episode, SpongeBob movie. Um, it, it, the list really goes on and on. There's just, there's so much out there. You have to do a little digging to find it, but there's, um, I mean, there's a car, the Odyssey. <laughs> you can drive that van if you'd like to. So <laughs> it's, there's um, everything from product names, to TV shows, to music, all kinds of stuff. Um, back to where, uh, oh brother, where art thou? Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that it is that people just can't get enough of it? Well, I think that people were very excited when that movie came out. I mean, first of all, that's a super entertaining movie. Um, it's an entertaining movie because it's telling a very entertaining story, and it's the same story that's old, you know, the Odyssey. Um, I think that people were just really excited. It's kind of like if you're a mythologist, it's like a mythology treasure hunt to watch that movie because you can kind of keep going through and finding new things each time and being like, oh my gosh, they're making an allusion to this here. Or, that character's meant to be this. 
Um, so I think people that are into this kind of stuff get really, really excited about it. It's also just really funny, um, and they do a good, t good job of capturing a modern myth by making like the dark characters larger than life and you know the funny parts are really comical and sweet it's just it's a it's really it's a beautiful movie so, yeah so. do you feel at times that it can be a little bit cliche just for how many times that it's used throughout our culture yeah the odyssey yes oh um well cliche would be one thing um See, I thought you were referring to a brother, and I was going to say, yeah, people just always use that one. It's the only <laughs> example. Um, see, I have a problem with, with it being cliche because it's, to me, that's such an old and important story that it's almost risen above the possibility of cliche. Sometimes things are such a part of who we are, and it's such a, like we all know the story of the man going home and going through a journey and, you know, not being able to get there and running into these episodes that it kind of rises above the possibility of cliche and becomes more of just you know what our culture is and who, how what we use as a reference so I think people are usually when they're referencing it you know I don't think people even really think about it anymore you see a cyclops or something you know what a cyclops is and you you just know what you know, and you don't necessarily think back to the Odyssey. Yeah, I hope that answers that, sort of. Why do you think that it is that we can still relate to the Odyssey even in modern times versus even though it was written uh, thousands of years ago? I think we can still relate to it um, because I, I think that that story is probably even older than the version that we know. Um, I think that there is a version of the Odyssey older than what Homer Homer or who, whoever it was that like actually wrote that down. So I think it's relatable because it's you know it's it's something that is I mean you've you've been there. You've wanted to go home. You've whether you're 13 years old at summer camp and you're just over it and you're like can't you know can't take it anymore. You're homesick. The, the feeling of homesick is something that Homer didn't invent. We're all, we all get homesick, and you want to go back. So it's, it's something that will remain relatable because it's, it's just a story that, we, that happens to us. So, yeah. And if you read it the right way, then you understand what a challenge that might have been. So, yeah. Do you think that myths will ever die out? No. I don't. I think we create new myths every day. I think that we mythologize people, um, even in modern times. I think you can look at examples of modern mythology. John Lennon, we mythologize and have made, you know, after his death into something that maybe is greater than the man that he was. Bob Marley has been mythologized, um, you know, even to a degree, you know, the great, incredible, impacting people in the world. Martin Luther King becomes a bigger, you, that's what mythology is. It's when a hero occurs and a person rises above the day-to-day -day of what we are and they impact our world, then we start to create mythology about, around them and we start to make their story into something that's even bigger than what they were. Um, it's our nature to mythologize. So I don't think they'll ever die out. I think they'll change and they'll evolve and we'll have different heroes or different names for the same hero over time. But no, I think we'll always have myths. If you were to write a book Ooh. about someone that's actually alive uh, and make, make them just the greatest hero, who would it be and what would their story be? Oh, man, that's tough. OK. Uh, oh, gosh. I don't know. I mean, I'm such a music nut that it would probably be a musician. Um, probably want to write about like Hank Williams or Johnny Cash <laughs> and even though that's already been done I mean think about that that's already been done they've already done like a Johnny Cash parody they've already made a myth, a myth out of that guy so but yeah something like that something about some you know blind banjo player myth <laughs> type thing I don't know. I'm not very good. Like for all the books that I read and all the novels, like I'm a really bad creative writer. 
So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really not that good at that. So I probably won't ever write a book like that. I'll leave that to my sister. Do you so. think that you would ever write a book? I don't know. I mean, probably not. So probably <laughs> I mean, not. I'll probably, if, we, if I did, it would be like a collection of essays or something. I have a very short attention span after a little while. So That's a novel, a like that. anything after 100 pages, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap out and <laughs> you know, go hiking or something. So, yeah. so where do you think that uh, tomorrow's myth, myths will come from? Um, I don't know. You know, that's a good question. We, I'm very interested in the way that social media will change the way that we mythologize people. Um, it already changes the way we impact cultural movements. So I think it will be interesting to see who the heroes are that rise up because I think that more than ever, we have access for everyday people to become something greater than they are. And yeah, maybe it's just 15 minutes of fame, but you see it all the time. Like, what was the, the thing in um, San Francisco, I think it was, with the bat kid? And it was a Make-A-Wish Foundation thing a couple weeks ago. And this little boy, um, for his Make-A-Wish Foundation, just wanted to dress up as Batman and get out of a car. And, you know, suddenly this was fed all over social media and thousands of people came out dressed in costume. and. You know, that becomes a whole story. That becomes something bigger than what you think it is. So who knows who the next hero will be or how they'll rise up. It's not going to be in the traditional way, though. Um, it'll be, I think that our next heroes will come from interesting everyday stories that people connect to. So, yeah. Do you think that it was more captivating back thousands of years ago where mom and pop told you a story and it was passed down and passed down and you're just sitting there in excitement or do you feel like in modern times where you can read it from a book or you can watch it on YouTube which one do you feel like is more captivating? Um, I think to me you know I think what there's it's interesting that when I'm reading Cold Mountain and if I could I, we could have never met and we could both read the same story and then we could connect over that so that what, that's what I think is great about modern culture. You know, whereas uh, in the oral tradition, it gets passed down and moved. But we could just be two different people that read the same myth and connected over it. And I think that that's, that's really neat. So, um, but I, you know, in terms of what's more captivating, I don't know. I think that it would be less the medium and more the story. So less, you know, is it a movie or is it a book? Or is it a storyteller? Because you can have really crappy storytellers too. So, and you can have you know poorly written books and badly directed movies. But it's so that's yeah a lot of that. Do you think that one day our culture will stray away from books? I certainly hope not. Uh, I don't even like want a Kindle or anything. I like books, I like the way they feel and smell. So. Yeah, I agree what, with you. That's I what won't I'm into. Own a Kindle either. No, I'm just I don't, stuck yeah. in my book. Yeah, I, I, will, I like the weight of a book. I certainly hope not. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment to wrap up Direction Northeast. My name is Brad Ketron. I'm a registered nurse, and I got my start at Northeast State. I chose nursing because it gives me the opportunity to take care of people. I know I'll always have a job and it gives me the opportunity to travel, which I've always wanted to do. So Northeast State was a great start for me. I was able to get my associate's degree there and transfer to a four-year college to get my RN license. I had always planned on going to college, but I wasn't really sure where I was going to go. After graduating Northeast State, I can truly say it was a good decision. That concludes the program for today. We examined the influences of the Odyssey on modern pop culture with expert Stephanie Murray. Community is very important to the students at Northeast State Community College, and this program takes a look at a few of the subjects that they find important. Until we meet next time, on behalf of the students, staff, and faculty of Northeast State Community College, I'm Chelsea Teaster, and this is Direction Northeast.